develop your own way of keeping records with, between you and Dr. Wong. So what I'm going to be doing is teaching Bucola how we keep records in my lab okay. in order, and then you'll have a sample of what, okay. what needs to be done. Now, when I learned to do this, I learned it by coming to TSU and deciding that I was going to be doing sex, and so nobody taught me any of this. I'd done a postdoc where I uh, prepared uh, the RNA probe so people could do in situ hybridization and all of that stuff. But in my, the lab I was in, there was a woman who was hired to do all the uh, tissue preparation, cryosectioning, and then I would make the probe and do all the molecular biology stuff because she couldn't do that hand it over to her, and that's what everybody in the department did, and then she would do all the sectioning and the and immunohistochemistry and stuff. So I knew what was involved, knew all those steps, had no idea how to do any of it uh, because I'd never done it. So when I came here and wanted to do it, I had to teach myself, and uh, since I didn't know how to do it, what I did was I went over to Vanderbilt and met, um, what is his name? He's retired now. Um, You'll see his name in the lab book that I have upstairs, and I've forgotten it. McKenna. McKenna is his name, M-C-K-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A. and he used to work on kidneys. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he was a uh, real good, uh, he was referred to me by the people there as an excellent uh, immunohistochemist. He knew all about what you had to do to prepare tissues, which is really what you have to be concerned about. So this is a process, and I'm going to go through it. So it's not like you just walk in and you start cutting and you got it. you got to know all these steps or at least be familiar with what you need to have, somebody should have done in order to, because the whole process is going to affect the outcome, okay? So anyway, uh, James McKenna taught me how to do the preservation of the tissue and how to do some of the immunohistochemistry, how to make fixatives, what fixative was better than another one. I learned that from him. And then Dave Ong, who was a vitamin A researcher at uh, Vanderbilt, working with Frank Kitchell. They have a long history of working in vitamin A work, and I knew them because the people I worked with uh, knew them. And so I introduced myself, and um, my first master's student worked in Dave Ong's lab to learn how to do what you learned the other day, which is the, you know, the, you know, now the sections are cut, let's react them mm -hmm. with something. And uh, Dave Ong was not an immunohistochemist, he was a biochemist. And so they essentially, and I've got the same rig upstairs, you'll see it, uh, took these things through a series of dips, and it's got a little thing, and you just go boom, boom, boom. And that worked for a long time. But over the years, we've developed new methods, new techniques, and that's how we arrived at Sequenza. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's many ways of doing this, and I'm telling you all this to tell you that, okay, and in the process of doing all of that, I'll never forget that uh, Dave Ong had in his uh, lab this great big guy. Uh, they look like map drawers. Have you ever seen map drawers when you go to the geologic survey or someplace to get a map? They're these long, wide drawers, and these skinny drawers like this that can hold big maps. And you pull them out. And so anyway, this big cabinet with these skinny drawers, and he pulled it out and said, see, these are all my slides. And I thought the man was nuts. Oh, man, you got all those slides? Who does this? Well, guess what we've got upstairs? We've got drawers and drawers and drawers of slides because after you think about it, these are your data. It's kind of like the data you keep on your computer for bioinformatic data or any other kind of data or your notebooks. But in this case, your data, your, your raw data, is on that slide. So if you're going to publish, you have to have a record of what it is that you're uh, using as your original material. So you need to come up with a, a system for tracking and retaining and archiving your data. And that turned out to be uh, not a, a straightforward thing, and so you have to be pretty organized. It beca you become a stamp collector, essentially. You've got to have good notes, good books, and you need to think this through from the beginning. So you're actually in a good position because I can take you from the beginning to what you need to do, and then you can go back and design sounds like a lot of work. It was a lot of work without anybody saying, do this, do that. But for you, since we've kind of um, invented the wheel, so to speak, um, it's a matter of just following a protocol that's been adopted and that works. 
so for you, there's no choice. I'm going to say follow this protocol, and it'll be efficient, straightforward. The hardest thing will be to take the notes to know how to follow the protocol. For you, you can be creative, do whatever you want, and adopt your own protocol. I say, hey, I don't need that, but um, my recommendation is that data is data, and you got it. If somebody came to you and said, "Well, oh, here's your publication, show me your data," and you've thrown out all the slides then you have no data, you just have, oh, I took this picture, and you go, okay, well, uh, yeah, let me look at it. And by the way, it's become even more important because if you have a section and you get a result, you've looked at that now, um, if you have the result here but not here, and you take the picture here and publish it, and you don't say, by the way, there was no signal down here, um, you know, it could be disputed, right? Um, so. Interpreting data is also difficult. Now, like your result, it was everywhere, right? That doesn't always happen. And that's one of our papers was on the aldehyde dehydrogenase. It took, it took months. Um, in fact, uh, Famita's project took months to convince ourselves that what we were seeing in those tissues was the truth. Because you can have all kinds of background. You can have inappropriate dilutions. I mean, it's, it's really time consuming and laborious. And the hardest part for us to learn was, if you've never seen this result before, how do you know it's real? So imagine if we'd never seen that before and there's all that background on that slide, I wouldn't know, well, I don't know, maybe the brown stain on the whole thing was important because nothing's supposed to stain. For you, if you've never looked at fat, you've never looked at this uh, gene before, you have no idea what to expect, where it should be, how it should look, and whether or not it's an artifact. Therefore, you have to do it over and over and over again until you convince yourself what the result is. And that's hard to do. Now, that result is going to be dependent on everything I'm going to tell you in the next hour. It may be due to the way you killed the animal and the stressors that were produced at that time. It may be due to the fact that you uh, didn't perfuse the whole animal with fixative right away. Instead, you drop fixed it. It may be due to the fact that you used the wrong fixative and destroyed your antigen or created other aber you know, aberrant antigens that you wish wouldn't react. So that's, what we, that's why you have to block the controls, OK? So the process of doing the controls to figure it all out and then going back and redo the whole thing from animal all the way forward until you convince yourself is the trick of being a good immunohistochemist or somebody who does in situ hybridization. So that's why I think it's very important that we spend this next hour going through the whole process, the protocol, how to do it, and then we'll go upstairs and learn the mechanics. The mechanics are simple. They take practice. But cutting a nice crowd section is not hard to do. And for you, it's going to be a piece of cake because you don't have any bones. For you, it's going to be a little more difficult because you do have bone. So we got to talk about bone as well as no bone. So liver, um, heart. Uh, oh, no, I'm going to take heart out of there because the heart has fiber. Mm -hmm. Liver and adipose tissue are simple because they have no structure that's going to be ruined when you cut it, think about a piece of salami that's just uh, bologna. When you cut bologna, you have nice sections. But let's say you're cutting uh, prosciutto or something that has like fat and meat and fiber. If you cut those things and you don't do nice, you know, you get that, um, what do you call it? It's, um, you kind of pull the fibers and it looks ugly. So you got to cut really nicely. And you got to have the right thickness and everything. So if you cut it too thin, uh, you might have holes in it. You cut it too thick, and it's a, it's, a, it's a nice slice, but who wants to eat something, you know, half inch thick? So you want the right nice thick, and it's got to have a nice presence when you put it on the dish to serve it. Well, the same thing goes for doing this experiment. You don't want drag. That's what I'm calling. And so drag would be this. Let's say um, this is fat, okay? You and this is your uh, piece of uh, tissue in this thing. So you're going to be cutting through here, cutting through here, cutting through here. So you're going to take this section and flip it over and look at it, and it's going to be looking like that. When it's fat, 
it's just going to look, and it doesn't matter what you cut through. It's like bologna. It's going to look the same no matter what you did. But let's assume now that this is olfactory tissue. Now, olfactory tissue is going to look like this when you cut it, if you have a good section. And within that section are going to be these turbinates. And this isn't authentic, but, you know, I'm just giving you the idea. Now there's going to be other stuff around here. I mean, other kinds of tissue and stuff going on. But we're worried about these areas, okay, that are um, the turbinate, okay? Now, the turbinate are bones in your back here in the back of your um, nasal cavity. Um, these are bone structures. And these bone structures are lined by the olfactory epithelium. Bucola wants to look at the olfactory epithelium. Now, the olfactory epithelium is around this bone. Okay? So if you're going to be cutting through here with a saw or whatever, some kind of a slicer, and you cut through here and there's a bone, what's it going to do? It's going to stop and it's going to go and then it's going to drag through. Your section's not going to look real pretty when you're done. It's going to look more like big holes all over. You have chatter, okay? Well, you can't publish that, nor can you do an experiment with that. This is what you need. So the art of cross-section cutting is to be able to cut a section that comes out looking like what you want to be uh, investigating. Okay. So how does one do that? Well, one thing, one trick is when you have bones, you can decalcify. That means remove all the calcium and magnesium that uh, contributes to the hard structure of bone. And there are several reagents that can be used. EDTA chelates calcium and magnesium, so you could soak the tissue in EDTA and calcium uh, buffer of the right strength, and there's recipes for this, for a month or something. Or you can put in um, acidic reagents because acids also dissolve bone. And the way we do it is using a reagent called RG Ketel, which is produced by a company, um, I think it's called DRC, and it's in Washington, the state of. And uh, what's nice about this is they've formulated something that has a little bit of both of those reagents, because if you use acid, you're going to maybe kill your antigen so it's no longer there. And if you use EDTA, you're going to be waiting a month. They put, they formulated something that we can do in less time. And so that's what we're using in the lab. So when I talk about RG key count, you will not be faced with that because you're using adipose, no bone. But we have to talk about that. All right, so what happens then is the bone dissolves, and now you've made something that's more like tendon, a lot easier to cut through because, but that's, but it's still going to have, um, some pull on it. It's still not going to be real easy. So you need a really sharp razor blade, which is what we're using, to cut. So that means you're going to have to move across that blade more often. So when we go upstairs and I say, okay, you're cutting, you're getting some drag here, we're going to move, and, you know, let's see how many. For you, I don't know, you're going to have to uh, look at it. We've cut some adipose tissue. It was pretty straightforward. You just cut it. We, we did all those things to see how much fat was in it using the, the dyes and so forth. So shouldn't be a big problem for you, but nonetheless, um, you know, you're going to learn as you go. I, I was going to say, we put our adipose samples into paraformaldehyde. Does that sound like a normal? Yeah, that's a fixative, and we use 4% paraformaldehyde in phosphate buffer as our fixative. Okay. okay. And we did the adipose tissue and used 4% paraformaldehyde in phosphate, and it worked beautifully. I mean, we okay. got the results we expected. Okay. And that's the fixative, so 
Um, so, those are some words, those are some ideas that are going to influence your downstream cutting outcome uh, based on the kind of tissue and the kind of issues. And that we're, so, we're going to be talking about drag, sharpness of the blade, how you position this, and so forth. So, I wanted to start by talking about that. Okay? So, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go through the whole process to get to where you're cutting these sections. So, we begin with the animal. So, the animal is going to be alive. You're going to have to make a decision. How am I going to sacrifice the animal? So, at each point, I'm going to make a little decision mark because there's always going to be decisions. Now, do you want to perfuse that animal? And in our case, the answer is yes. So for the olfactory, from the mice and the rats, we perfuse. And the reason we perfuse the whole animal is because that way the fixative gets into the olfactory epithelium and begins to fix inside. If we open up the nose and then take the olfactory tissue out and drop it in to fix, well, it can't necessarily penetrate. Now you've got blood cells in these. Now remember that picture I showed you had these bones. There's a lot of holes in your nasal passages, right? For good reason. Air is coming through there. Well, those holes are going to, and there's also blood flowing through all this. And all that blood we want to wash out, and we want it to be a nice, clean prep as much as we can. We're still going to have a few red blood cells in there, but we want that clean. Perfusion flushes all that away, and you don't have to see it. Okay? So, for, the, for tissues like the olfactory epithelium, we perfuse the whole animal. In your case, you don't need to do this because it's just a piece of fat. It, it's not going to have a lot of blood supply or nothing. You're just going to cut it out and drop it into fix. So, there's two choices. You can perfuse or you can drop fix. Okay. Now, if you're going to perfuse, the animal has to be alive. That means you have to dissect the ca chest cavity open, take a cannula, stick it into the heart, and then flush the whole animal system with uh, phosphate buffered saline, and then follow that up by perfusing it with fix for about 20 minutes. Now you can dissect out your tissue and drop fix it. to finish the fixation process. Okay, if you're going to do this, then you have to drug, you have to anesthetize the animal. So at that point, you have to choose what anesthetic you're going to use. Are you going to use phenobarbital? Are you going to use ketamine? I mean, there's several drugs of choice. Everything you do to an animal has an effect. And so, you can worry about these things. Some people do, some people don't. Um, we worried about it, and uh, I don't think we have, we, we like uh, ketamine, xylazine best, and that's what we use. Um, some people use phenobarbital, but there might be effects of phenobarbital in the system that may be influencing. If you're looking at, are things turning on or things turning off, you don't want to be turning things on or off. And in our hands, ketamine, xylazine hasn't caused concern. But I'm bringing this up because if at some point in your life you're going to make a new project and you want to try something new, this comes to mind how we're going to do this. In our hands, we started collaborating with Doug Sawyer at Vanderbilt, and we're now not just doing olfactory, we're doing heart. Now all of a sudden the question is, how do you get a nice piece of heart tissue? Remember I said that um, we worried about the fibers. Well, even though heart is easy to cut, no bone in it, turns out that you, it has all those fibers, and when you cut through it, you can have just ugly, ugly sections. So, um, it's not easy, to, as you would think, to cut a heart because of all those muscle fibers. So, the, then the other problem with heart is heart is really susceptible to stress. So, we actually had one of his... Um, 
uh, research assistants come over and work with us so that she could dissect out the right ventricle and the left ventricle and do it in such a way that it wouldn't stress. She has a lot of experience in this and what she would do is, and I, I don't know how she did it, but whatever, it had to be done within a perimeter, a certain, you weren't here, you didn't get to see it, but in any case, it had to be done within a certain amount of time. She wanted it done within 10, 20 seconds or whatever. She did not want to uh, anesthetize the animal. She wanted to use, um, well, we started with ketamine. And when she looked at the heart, it, the, she saw um, fibrillation. And she said, when it starts fibrillating, that messes up everything. We don't want any fibrillate. So we had to move the whole process over to the hood. And she wanted to uh, sack the animal with um, not ether, but uh, what did she use? Something like ether. I can't remember what it is. It's quite commonly used. Uh, gas. Anyway, she wanted to use gas to anesthetize the animal because in her hands over there at Vanderbilt, that's how they do it. So there's, a, there's various ways to uh, anesthetize the animal, and when you use gas, like ether or whatever you choose to use, uh, you don't want to be breathing that because you're going to go to sleep as well as the animal. So in any way, you, you put the animal under, and in her hands, we would, she would open that uh, chest cavity, boom, uh, she would check to make sure the heart was still beating, the animal's got to be alive, she did not want to perfuse ahead of time. She immediately clipped it out, made sure it wasn't fibrillating, and then she quickly dissected it, rinsed it in PBS, and uh, set it aside so that we could do the uh, fixation afterwards, okay? So there's various ways. So you have to make decisions here. So in our case, for, our, for heart, for OE, we perfuse. For um, heart, we don't but we have special ways. But we had to make a decision on, okay, if we're not going to do it this way, using drugs, and you want to get this out while the heart's still beating, we're still going to anesthetize. But in this case, we're going to use some kind of gas that puts you under. Now, in your case, you're probably just going to cut the head off and go to town. So uh, we call that um, decapitation. If it's a mouse, there's another way to do it. You can just go and break the you know, connection between the spinal cord and the brain. Whatever, you need to make a decision. Um, what Now, that way of doing that, I know people still do that, but it's not accepted by the animal care folks. The animal care folks are now of the opinion that you need to use CO2. So decapitation and um, severing the spine is a no-no. Um, you need to use CO2. So, do you use CO2? Okay, so to use CO2, what you do is you have a canister of CO2, you put the animal in there, and for mice and rats, in our hands, three minutes, put them down. Um, when you open them up, the heart's still beating, but they're dead, essentially. And then what we do is we open and get our heart, cut the head off to absolutely um, make sure that they're dead at that point. But we get the heart out first because we want it still beating because we want it uh, to, to be going. So this is the acceptable method. This is also acceptable, but you have to get it approved by your local animal care. Everything you're doing needs to be filed with our animal care folks to tell them exactly what you're going to do. Now, if you need to use decapitation, I mean, you can't do it, or some other way of killing that is not normally approved, then you have to ask your board and justify, there's no other way to do this. We just can't do it any other way, okay? Now, we have a CO2 setup, and you're welcome to use it if you want to use it. And Picola knows how to teach you how to use it because she does it all the time. It doesn't take a lot of CO2. If we run out of CO2 and I don't have any money, I'll come to... Uh, long and say, hey, can you help me out? So for now, we've got CO2, and you don't use a lot as long as you don't waste it. You're welcome to come across the hall, use that CO2, and that's the appropriate way to kill the animals. 
if you're using ketamine or drugs, you got to get it approved by the thing, and then you got to find somebody who will buy you drugs, because ketamine turns out to be the same as ecstasy, and we don't want people thinking we're all druggies, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and you have to keep it under two locks. Mm -hmm. Two locks. So one lock, something else that's locked, so that nobody knows about it and can't get in there unless you have the key. Now, in terms of reporting, if you use drugs, you have to have a drug log that can be available for inspection at any time. So the day you used it, how much you used it, you check out. So that they can go through and say, well, gee, you uh, bought 100 mils and you uh, only recorded that you used one mil, where's the other 99? And you go, well, I don't know where the other 99 is. Well, that's not a good answer. And not only will you get in trouble if people actually impose the, the, um, the restrictions of the law, the TSU as a university would get in trouble because we have assurances to the NIH and other places that we are following the guidelines for the uh, appropriate care use of drugs, animals, and everything else. Okay? All right. So there's the first step of drug record keeping, but there's another step of record keeping which I'm not even going to go into because you should already have this going on. You have to track every animal you've got, check it in, check it out, say why was it killed, why was it sacrificed, everything, because they should be able to. Frankly, at this university, they did it one year where every year we would have to file how many animals we had and uh, what, how many we had every single month. And Brian, or no, let's see, Dr. Browning hasn't come to me for the last couple of years to ask me for that report. Nonetheless, in our laptop, we know everything that's happened to every mouse. I just sent, I don't know, 60 mice off to Allegheny, and I checked them all out. You and I have to catch up on the vitamin A deficient ones, because frankly, I'm behind. Haven't checked those out. But we have a running record of every mouse. If we threw them, excuse me, discarded them, because the litters were getting to be too many, then we, we write down, uh, didn't need this group, sacked the litter, threw it out. But you have to record that you had it. I don't know the rules for chickens, but I think they're exactly the same. Exactly the same. Okay. So just be aware that you're tracking your animals. Okay. So the first level of tracking is the animal. We have books in which we track the animals. We have a way of naming our animals, and we name them in consecutive numbers. And so um, upstairs on the refrigerator and also on the side of the cabinet, you'll see it when we go up there to cut sections, we have a naming system. And that naming system I don't have memorized because it's very long, but I'm going to write a, an example of one, and if I'm wrong, do it right when we're upstairs. So the animal has an ID. Let's say it's LR345. Why is it 345? Because that was animal 345 in that group of animals. Next animal that we get will be 346. It's just very convenient. That's how we do it. Now, the animal has a name. It also has a sex. So if it's important to the experiment, whether they're males or females, then we record if it was a male or a female. Now, if they're all males, and you've recorded that in your notebook, 